Hello, hello. Is that, yeah? All right. Um, the session of the technical difficulties. <laughs> uh, thanks for the introduction, Mike. Um, so yeah, this is joint work with Carmit, Emmanuel, and Peter. We're all in the room. So if you have any extra question after the talk, because I'm going to have to skip some things, uh, you can catch us, catch us at, any, at any point during the conference. Um, so I want to start, to start uh, also not by giving you what is MPC. We're all in the MPC session. We know what it's about. Um, but uh, we also, also all agree that it, this is great, and there's many problems that MPC can address, right? We have a lot of parties that want to do uh, maybe private service, uh, statistics. We have uh, the farmers in Denmark that want to do their sugar beet auction. We have uh, all these uh, blockchain people that want to do uh, secret stuff. And uh, <laughs> there's a problem with some of these scenarios, uh, which is that most of the protocols we have at the moment for MPC don't really scale very well for having these many, many parties. And the reason for this is that we have achieved a lot, but we have always been focusing on this scenario in which we have a few number of parties, a very like two, three, or it can generalize, but it blows up a lot. Um, so th this kind of scenarios, what we do sometimes is that we have maybe, we say, oh, we have some servers, and we are going to expect these thousands of parties to agree that some of these three is, are going to be fine. And that's sometimes not very realistic uh, when you consider that each of these thousand parties is going to trust at least one of these three servers, for example. Um, or you can do these techniques of sampling a random uh, subset of parties, this committee, uh, that is going to run uh, MPC for everyone. But still, if you start with thousands of parties, you're going to end up with a committee that has tens or hundreds or parties, very, very likely. Um, so this is the starting point of our work. Can we do things better here? And we are considering uh, also this honest majority here. And the reason for this is that if we are going for many parties, let's exploit this to make our protocols more secure. So the more parties we are going to have, the more uh, trustworthy this system is going to be. And I think a good example for this, apart from all the ones I gave, is this uh, Tor Metrics uh, project within the Tor project, uh, in which you have, you have like 6,000 relays on the Tor network. And at the moment, we don't really know much about what's going on within Tor. Uh, we, we have some statistics that they provide, but they don't use MPC for this. What they do is that they obfuscate the, their data before publishing it. And then you get some aggregate result that it's going to be affected by this, by this kind of noise that you're, you're aggregating locally. Um, so, and also most of these 6,000 parties, they don't really uh, provide data because they're still not really trusting this. Um, so if we had MPC that would scale to these many parties, we could have more complex functions. Uh, parties would be probably more willing to provide data and so on, and we could have like a vector picture of where is censorship happening? Uh, how can we improve the traffic on the network? And so on. All right, so more concretely, the setting that we are studying here uh, is concrete efficiency, because we want people to run these kind of things eventually for this large number of parties, tens, hundreds, thousands. As this is one of the first steps, we're just going to deal with static passive adversaries, but still we're in this strong dishonest majority setting. And our protocols are going to be in this offline online phase, like with the fever triples or couple circuits uh, for Boolean circuits. So now about the complexity of, practi of practical protocols for MPC. Um, we have this kind of vague picture. This is not really accurate, but it's like, oh, if we have um, this honest majority, we have this uh, quadratic complexity in the number of parties times the security parameter, Otherwise, you can do something like n log n. But uh, also one of the issues uh, here in the literature is that when we were thinking about this honest majority, because we were thinking of these very few parties, we were thinking most of the time of this full threshold adversary, in which all but one of the parties was corrupted. But is it really realistic to consider that when you have 
a thousand parties, 999 of them are conspiring against the single on the sky? Well, I don't think it is really. So this is the fact that we exploit in our protocols. So can we do protocols uh, where each honest party present on the computation is going to help us to get something more efficient? Um, the answer is yes, otherwise I wouldn't be here. Um, so we have a new passive GMWG style uh, protocols in which we obtain up to uh, 25 times uh, less communication than the best result in the literature uh, uh, published last year by the Suki et al. Um, on the constant round setting, we produce garbled circuits on the BMR paradigm uh, where we reduce by a factor, up to a factor of seven the communication in garbling this circuit. And we also get a more online phase that is a bit more circuit dependent. Um, all these details about the garbled circuits, uh, you can ask me later or here or offline because I won't have time to discuss. Uh, but it is interesting that these are the kind of the best improvements we get, but for as small as 20 parties, we start getting protocols that are more efficient. And they are quite efficient already when we have like 10 to 30% on these parties, which is not a lot to ask when you have that many. All right, so I want to introduce you to what is the technique that we're using. This is a very simple example. If you understand this, you're going to understand everything else. So imagine you have N servers. We're going to give a number and a color to each one, and they want to encrypt a message. Now, the way they can do this is that each of them is going to hash uh, their key. And now they are going to sum these hashes to the message. And we know that this is uh, indistinguishable from random as long as the keys are security parameter long. Even in this case in which, oops, sorry, all but, all but one of the, of the servers are corrupted. But what happens now if we assume that we have eight on Spartans, right? So the title of the paper might give you the idea already. What happens if we use shorter keys? So instead of having this uh, security parameter long keys, we are going to have uh, of some arbitrary smaller length L, these keys. And now we want to argue whether this is still indistinguishable from random. Intuitively, the adversary has to guess each of the short keys of each of this party, right? But formally, is it secure? Uh, well, one of the problems with having these L-bit keys is that each of the hash functions has a very uh, small possibility, a small domain for the keys you can choose. So imagine you have uh, L equal to, you only have four possible keys. You can brute force this very, very easily. Um, and in particular, we can represent this brute forcing by this uh, matrix product. So we have the columns here uh, representing the evaluation of the hash function on each of the possible keys. There's two to the L keys, remember? And then here we have this vector of length two to the L and having weight one that is going to represent which key we pick. So this is another way of representing uh, the, this evaluation here. So if we just uh, substitute this uh, for every uh, hash function, what we end up having is um, this uh, uh, matrix product where we have uh, this this matrix H filled with uh, random values, which are the evaluations of the hash function. And on the right, we have these H blocks, each of them with length two to the L and having weight one. Uh, so this sum of the hashes now is equivalent to saying, okay, is this value Y, which is the matrix times uh, this vector, is this indistinguishable from random? Um, now, there's another way in which you could look at this that is uh, much nicer. Or maybe you go looking at the colors and you say, well, this is the flag of New York City. Um, no, it's not that. Um, so what this is is a, a coding theory problem uh, where we, have, we can look at H as the parity check matrix of our random binary linear code. Uh, e is going to be an error in a code word which has this particular regularity property, where we have these, these blocks, uh, H of them, one for each on party, the length is related to the keys, and they have having weight one. And then we also have uh, Y, 
which is the syndrome from which we want to recover the error. This is the problem you have in coding theory. You have your syndrome and you want to recover the error. Uh, so now the problem is like, given this heritage matrix and the error, and sorry, and the syndrome, can we recover E? Uh, so someone might think that I'm cheating you because this looks more like a key recovery attack, right? This was, these were the keys. And I was just talking about indistinguishability. But it turns out that we have a search to decision reduction, so actually finding E is as hard as distinguishing Y from random. So this is very nice. Um, it's also not the first time this problem has, be, has been used in cryptography. Uh, actually, for the SHA-3 comp competition, there was this uh, fast syndrome-based hashing proposed by Agot, Vinyas, and Sendrier. And it turns out that adding this regularity to, to the syndrome decoding problem doesn't make things much easier. And the syndrome decoding problem is equivalent to learning parity with noise, which is a problem that we're widely using in the literature. Uh, and now, uh, what we have to deal with is uh, getting these parameters right, where R in this matrix that we had is the length of the message that we're masking. Uh, then we have L uh, for the key length, and H is the number of honest parties. And it turns out that this problem, it's even statistically hard if you have a small enough message, small enough R, or if you have a large enough number of honest parties. So if you don't like all of this, uh, this assumption, which uh, actually there's many, many people who have studied it, uh, you can just uh, have larger H, and you're going to have something that is statistically secure. But yeah, I, I wouldn't be able to name all, all of the people here, uh, but this is, these are works that have studied uh, concretely this uh, uh, regular syndrome decoding problem, or uh, the techniques that are used to cryptanalyze it. Uh, all right, so if we got that example, uh, it's going to be easy during the rest of the talk. As I said, we have two results. We have a secret sharing kind of result. Uh, so this is what we call here like this tiny GNW. And then we have also a garbled circuits result, which is this tiny BMR. Uh, for the secret sharing uh, based protocol, we get a key length as small as one bit, single bit, and this is what I'm going to focus on during the rest of the talk. And for garbled circuits, uh, L can only be as small as five, which is quite good already. Um, this is actually quite challenging, so I'm, I'm going to skip this because it would be too many details, but one of the difficulties here were, was dealing with circuits that have a very high fan out. So if you have a, a gate, that's going to fill many, many gates. This is going to be difficult with our assumption. Um, this is a relative problem to what happens when you have uh, the free XOR technique, where you have this correlation that is in, across all your gates in the circuit. Uh, so I'm going to give a very quick recap of GMW, and then a graph about our uh, complexities more concretely, and that will be the end of the talk, and you can ask questions. All right, so GMW is a secret sharing based protocol uh, where each of the parties here is going to have an additive share of, remember we're dealing with Boolean circuits. So we have all linear operations that can be done uh, locally. So if we want to add these values X and Y, we can, parties can just locally add their shares. Uh, but the problem comes when we have to compute the end of two bits because we need to compute this, this product here, all these cross products actually. Uh, but we know how to do this. Uh, if we have oblivious transfer, and we have a one out of two uh, oblivious transfer for the bits, uh, this is equivalent to multiplication. So if Alice has as her inputs uh, R and R plus YJ, and Bob has as the choice bit uh, the value XI, uh, what Bob is going to get here is R plus XI times YJ, right? If XI is zero, he's just getting R, Otherwise, he gets that. Um, now what the, the Alice and Bob got is a secret sharing of X, uh, XY times YJ, which is, would be one of these cross products here. Um, oblivious transfer is very nice, but we know that it requires uh, public key operations. Uh, nevertheless, we also know that uh, we can do this uh, great uh, technique called OT extension. Uh, so here we are following uh, the 
the technique by Ishai et al., Ishai, Tilly, and Nissim, and Petrank in 2003, uh, where we have this uh, base uh, OTs in which we are going to use public key. So we have security parameter, one out of two OTs on these security parameter strings. I'm not going to give much detail, but what you can think is that each of these uh, OTs, each of these security parameter OTs, is kind of fixing one bit of uh, Bob's uh, secret key. Uh, and this, uh, this secret key then can be combined with, with symmetric crypto uh, to obtain many, many OTs. So just using a PRG, some hash function, and some messages from Bob to Alice, uh, we're going to get this uh, R OTs, where R is as big as we want. So what's, what's the way we improve this? We shrink the keys again. Uh, instead of doing uh, security parameter-based OTs, we're just going to do L of them. Um, so this is reducing the number of public key operations, but most importantly in practice, this is going to reduce the communication complexity here. Uh, but there is some problem uh, with this, actually, which is that this OT now becomes uh, leaky. So there is this, uh, at some point here, you're hashing, Bob is kind of hashing his key, and he's sending that plus his chase bits to, to Alice, and now the problem is that I said that L can be as small as one bit. So Alice can just try the two different keys and can very easily learn uh, the chase bits of, of Bob. See, here with Bob, I'm representing the, the R, the R uh, inputs of Bob to each OT. So this is completely broken, right? What's, what are we doing here? Well, let, let's use a broken primitive to do a secure protocol. Um, so here in blue, I'm representing honest parties. In red are corrupted parties. Um, remember, we want to compute the end of these uh, two values. And one of the ways in which we can represent this product is, is, is like this. We can just represent as the product of this, which with the parentheses over there, right, for, for everyone. Um, we also have our leaky OT. So the honest parties are going to uh, compute an OT with this x as their inputs. Uh, now, the, each malicious party is going to learn this kind of leakage from all of them. So on their, the short key that was set up, uh, plus uh, the, the inputs. Um, now, oh, it's going too fast. Uh, so we knew that each of these, like, it's very easy to break, right? Um, so how, how are we going to get around of this? Well, instead of uh, having the parties, the honest uh, parties to run the, the leaky OT with their actual inputs, we are going to re-randomize these inputs by using some random sharings of zero. So uh, each uh, party, each one's party, so P1 is going to uh, mask it with some value S, S1j, P2 with a value S2j, and what it holds with these values is that if we sum them across this first coordinate, they give zero. So now the leakage Oh, sorry. Well, the correctness is still going to hold. And what happens with the leakage now is that uh, these values are uniformly random. So each of these messages is going to look uniformly random. But nevertheless, they are, they are still correlated, right? So individually, they are uniformly random. But what happens when you, when you look at the joint distribution? Uh, so if you, can, if you sum all of these, you're the adversary. Um, now you can go like, OK. This, I know that it is zero, because it's the sum of all the sharings of zero. I can take that out. So now uh, I have this leakage. We have the sum of the H short keys of the honest parties, plus uh, the honest shares that I was missing. Uh, so if you understood the example at the beginning of the talk, this is uh, exactly what I gave with the toy uh, example of the distributed encryption. You have the H uh, short keys. So we know that this is secure under our assumptions. So that's, that's it. That's the simple technique that we, that we use. Um, we get some, so this is our results. <coughs> Sorry, more concretely. Uh, on the blue line, we have the best uh, uh, version of GMW that we have at the moment in the passive setting. Uh, so we have around, this is a plot for 200 parties. Um, this is the communication complexity for producing a triple or computing an AND gate. Uh, on orange, we have this technique of using committees. So this means that 
if we have, for example, 10 honest parties, instead of running GMW between all of them, we are going to run it between uh, 191. So we know there's at least one honest party, and we can just reduce the, the known problem. And in red is our results where we combine these uh, committees uh, with the shortest technique. So we're going to have two committees, one that has eight honest parties, the other one with one party, and we're going to combine these. So that's uh, in a bit more detail what we do. Um, so yeah, this is uh, our, work, our work, or a part of our work, better said. We have introduced this new technique of distributing trust in MPC when we have this large scale scenario where the more honest parties we have, the shortest we can make the keys, the better communication complexity and computation as well. Uh, we improve protocols for as soon as we have 20 or more parties. Uh, for secret sharing, we get up to 25 improvements in communication compared with the best uh, protocol uh, secure against all but one corruptions or the gap you could see from the previous slide when you use committees. Uh, for garbled circuits, we get up to seven times uh, better communication for the garbling of the circuit, which is the most costly part. And our online phase uh, is uh, up to three times faster, uh, depending on the circuit. So as I said, there's these challenges with dealing with the fan out of the specific circuit. So this is an interesting problem to explore, maybe compilers that are good for this, or a more concrete analysis. Also, uh, as I said, this was the first step. We took a second step already. Uh, we have an actively secure uh, version of this tiny keys technique in which we apply uh, tiny keys to the tiny OT protocol where we have this kind of pairwise information theoretic max. And what we are doing is that we are doing these ones short and we are still secure. So uh, that's going to be soon on ePrint. Um, also, there are some challenges still open. We can maybe optimize this more. Uh, maybe if we got even more cryptanalysis, it would be great because we have some quite conservative uh, parameters at the moment uh, in our experiments and yeah, getting more applications as well. So that's it. Thank you very much. And I'll take any questions.